So recently, I've been going to the gym. I know many of you are like, bro, that's obvious. We can look at you and, and see. <laughs> you know, the only person who has actually complimented me about going to the gym is Ray. Where is he? I don't know where he is. He's somewhere here. Shout out to Ray. He's such an encouraging man. Thank you, sir. Just every time he sees me, your shoulders, have you been going to the gym? <laughs> well, Ray, yes, I have, Ray. Thank you so much. But I've been going to the gym lately for the last few months, and I love it. It's a lot of fun. No, I don't actually love it. I hate it. But here's why I started going to the gym. Um, well, Roberta was making a few, like, like microaggression comments, just like, like not like an attack, but like pretty much was an attack. She denies it. Ask her, be like, were you saying discouraging things to your husband? She'll say, no, 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 no. I was just, I was just encouraging him. I mean, whatever it was, it worked. But, but here, was, here was the kicker. I was, I was sitting down one day and Rome, our daughter, she's about to turn two. She comes up and she lifts my shirt and she starts like slapping my, my stomach like it was like an instrument and she was fascinated by the reaction of my stomach to her slap. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is jiggling a little bit. And I realized in that moment like, dang, COVID really got me. Because before that I was like in peak optimal shape, but COVID took me down. And I realized like, man, I need to get back to the gym. So I've been going to the gym, struggling to get there, but doing my best to, to not have a dad bod. Um, but here's the thing about going to the gym. When I go to the gym, when I do anything really, I don't want to go to the gym and just get like a little bit in shape. Like when I go and why I've been going so consistently over the last few months is I want to get in the best shape of my life. Like if I'm putting in any amount of effort, I want an A plus, not a B minus. Like I want, the, I want to achieve the fullest potential. Like I'm not going to the gym for like a two pack, you know what I'm saying? Like I want a six pack. Have you seen really ripped, shredded dudes who have like abs on their sides? <laughs> they look like, like, a, like, a, like a Batman toy, just chiseled, like crate. Like, that's what I want to get. Now, can I? Do I have ge the genetics for it? I don't know. I guess we'll find out in a few years. But that's what I'm after. I want to get in the best shape of my life. I want to outrun Sean Quigley. I don't know if that's possible, but I'm going to try. That's my motivation. I want Roberta to not make aggressive, passive-aggressive comments to me. That's my goal. No, but I want to get in the best shape of my life. I want to be the healthiest. I want to feel good, of course, but I really want to look good. You know what I'm saying? I want to look good. I want to feel confident. I want to feel good. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel strong. I don't want Rome to be able to, you know, say things like, you know, Jim Gaffigan's kids always make fun of him. And, and I, I just don't want that to happen. So I'm, so I'm trying to get in the best shape of my life. Now, here's what I've been thinking about this, this last week as we conclude this collection that we're in, this collection called Summer Fruit. We've been going through the fruit of the Spirit. When it comes to the things of God, we shouldn't want just a little bit. We shouldn't want just a part of his promise, a part of his power, uh, uh, to know him just a little bit. We should want it in its fullest. If God says, hey, I have something for you, we should want all of it. If God makes a promise, we should chase after all of it. God's very best. And this isn't just a pipe dream. Scripture actually teaches us and tells us God wants to give you all of it, all of himself. Okay, so today we're going to lean in as we close out this collection and we're going to talk about joy. Now, some of you are realizing, wait, this is only week eight and there's nine fruit of the spirit. Unfortunately, because of timing, because next Sunday we're not having service, we're actually missing a whole week. We planned ahead on this one, right? Um, we're missing a whole week. So we're, we're missing goodness. So if you really, really care, go to YouTube, search Sermon on Goodness next week, because we're not having in-person service, but we're closing out with joy. So this whole context for this collection comes from Galatians chapter five. Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. And he's talking to them about what it looks like to follow Jesus and to live in step with the spirit. What does God do in your life and produce in your life? It's producing, it's growing. That's why it's called fruit, that it should never like grow stagnant. It's always growing. It's always producing. It's always getting better. It's always getting more. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 to 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy. That's what we're talking about today. 
Peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That's the one we're missing, unfortunately. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So we're talking about joy. And here's why I think this is so timely. This idea of like the fullness of joy. And we'll get to a text where Jesus actually says, I want you to have complete joy. I want you to have full joy. So it's not just me making it up. It's the promises of scripture. And joy is one of those things that feels very elusive, doesn't it? Like we read scripture and we gather in church and we hear about joy. Like I think this might be the third message on joy that we have preached at Rose Church this year. We preach on it, we talk on it because it feels so elusive. It feels almost impossible. Like we can have little bits of joy, little moments of joy, you know, good moments. And then we're like, well, I'm just not really experiencing joy right now. So it feels elusive. It feels like it's impossible to actually catch and then keep. But here's the thing about joy, is that joy is not a feeling. It is a state of being. It is not something you feel momentarily. It is a state that you exist in. And from this text, we learn that joy is a byproduct of following Jesus. That joy happens in our lives when we walk in step with the Spirit. What God is producing inside of us, joy is an inside job, not an outside job. We become joyful on the inside. I think what has happened, not just with joy, but in general in our Christianity, is we have overcomplicated what it looks like and what it means to follow Jesus. And we attach rules and obligations and rituals and all of these things so that we can get right with God and be a good follower of God and be a good Christian. And I think those practices, for the most part, are good, but it's our mindset that we attach to it that makes it actually uh, more complicated than it needs to be. Following Jesus is simple. It really, really is. But we overcomplicate it. Now, under the, underneath the surface, we can get into a whole complex theologies and all of these things. So God is complex, but following God is simple. And I think we need to understand that in our walks with God so we don't grow frustrated. But when it comes to joy, joy is much more simple than we make it to be. So, so here's what I want to do for the remainder of time that we have today. I want to give you five thoughts on joy. My mes message is titled Simple Joy because I really do believe that joy is simple. And I want to give you five very, very simple thoughts on joy. This is not going to be an ethereal message. There are going to be practical application points, things that you can do in your life or mindsets that you can begin to possess that will see joy produced in your life. It's available but there are some steps that we need to take to ensure that it remains in our hearts and in our souls, that it remains on the inside of who we are. So point number one, I want to encourage you to take notes today. If you've got to pull out your phone, if you've got a journal, take notes today, because I think this is one of those things that you could go back later when you're not feeling joy and be like, which of these do I need to initiate in my life right now? so I can begin to experience the joy that Jesus promises me. So here's where we're starting. Here's our starting point. Joy is our connection to God. Joy is our connection to God. Now I want to start in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. This is what it says. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So Jesus on the cross, picture him on that cross, bruised, beaten, 
bloody. A gruesome scene. Details that are uncomfortable to get into. Jesus is on the cross, sacrificing himself, dying after being tortured, imprisoned, betrayed. The book of Hebrews tells us the author, which many believe is Paul, says that while he was on the cross, what allowed him to endure, what allowed him to persevere, was the joy that was before him. Now, what was the joy that was before him? It was this, knowing that by this sacrifice, by his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus would bridge the gap, close the chasm, uh, get rid of the divide that existed between God and man. In that human beings who chose to accept the gift of salvation and put their faith in Jesus would be reconciled in their relationship and their connection to God. Jesus himself found joy, enough joy to endure the cross, knowing that he would be connected to you and to me. This gave Jesus joy. So then we can take that If Jesus found joy in his connection to us, we too find our primary source of joy in our connection to Jesus. Where does joy come from? Where do I get it? How do I find it? You get it in your connection to Jesus. I think oftentimes where we feel a lack of joy is a disconnection from Jesus. Now, are you actually disconnected from Jesus. No, never. I feel far from God. I feel like he's so far away. We feel like that, but God is is like a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is around us, in front of us, beside us, behind us, and in us. It is a mindset that we have, not a reality that we exist in when we feel like God is far away or we are disconnected, but it's just being aware of what God is doing in our lives, whether we feel high, mundane, or low. There's a really powerful text I want to share with you. John chapter 15. We're going to read 11 verses. Jesus is talking and he says this. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I'm going to abide in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. He's defining the relationship. And you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers and the, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you would bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things... I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is where we get the promise. Your joy can be full. Your joy can be complete. Your joy can be whole. You don't have to feel like you're lacking joy because it's available to you. But how do you get it? By abiding, by connecting. You know what I feel far from God really is? It's the branch trying to be the vine. And you realize, man, I can't do it on my own. I'm a branch and I've been trying to do, be, be the vine. I've been trying to be my own Lord. I've been trying to be my own master. I've been trying to take control of my life. I've been trying to do it my way. I've been trying to do it on my own. I've been trying to, you know, get successful. I've been trying to hustle. I've been trying to be good. I've been trying to do all of these things. And you know what you've done? You've, you've, you've stopped being a branch and you've become the vine. But branches cannot be the vine. V- branches connect to the vine. And through connection to the vine, we have all things. Jesus is 
really emphasizing this idea, the core tenet of Christianity. What is it? It's connection to God. The whole gospel message is that we were sinful and separated. So God made a sacrifice so we could find our security and our connection to him. This is the gospel. And we try to overcomplicate it. It's about this and this and this. No, no, no. It's about being in relationship with God. As you're connected to God in your rightful order, a branch connected to the, vi- to the vine, there is whole joy, complete joy, full joy. And you know what's so incredible about being connected to Jesus, to being in relationship with Jesus that is unique to being connected and in a relationship with him. No one else can give you this. Is you're, you're secure in him. My second point is this. Joy is our position in Christ. Joy is our position in Christ. You are secure in him. Not only are you connected to him, but you are hidden in him. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. How incredible is that? He doesn't see your works or your deeds or your actions. He sees the work of Jesus on the cross. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It is hidden. It is secure. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You are connected to Jesus by putting your faith in him. You are a branch connected to the vine. And from connection to the vine, you get all things and you get your joy. And that connection is secure. You don't have to worry about it being severed because you are hidden. No one can find it except for you and Jesus. And no one can take that away. Furthermore, the Bible says that we are children of God. So you're not just a rando who rando who he's like, come and just like be a branch and connect to me. No, you are more than that. You are like a child to a heavenly father. First John chapter three, verse one says, see what kind of love. Have you ever wondered what kind of love does God love me with? How much does he love me? See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Stop questioning that you are a child of God. Some of you are here and it is a weekly, daily, hourly battle. But does he really love me? Does he like me? Am I actually, is he actually my heavenly father? He said it. And so we are. Case dismissed. Episode over. It's a wrap. The conclusion has been declared. And so we are, children of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So you are connected to God, and in that you get your joy. But you are secure in him, you are hidden in him, and you are his children. You are his child. Just for a moment. And if, you're grown, if you've grown up in church, you're like, I kind of know that. But what would it look like in this moment for you to have some childlike faith and really allow that reality to wash over you? Maybe you're 60, maybe you're 70, maybe you're 30. You've been following Jesus since you were four. And language like this doesn't really affect you anymore. What would it look like to just pray really quickly, God, allow, allow me to have childlike faith to really just receive this? That God calls me a child of God. He will not dispose of me. That he cares about me. That he loves me. That he looks at me in my life and he's proud. And he smiles. When our daughter Rome goes into like full demon mode and she's having a temper tantrum and she's flailing and doing all these crazy things, I don't stop loving her. This is what it means to be a child of God. And can I take it just one step further to really drill this in, this idea that we are secure in Christ. John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus is talking and he says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never 
cast out. Joy is our position in Christ. When I read this text the other week, it made me so happy on the inside. It filled me with so much joy. He will never cast me out. Those who he calls come to him and those who come to him, he will never cast out. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And even when I'm at my lowest, even when I feel far from him, he is near, beckoning me closer as a heavenly father. He's not going anywhere, even when I've decided to take matters into my own hand and I walk a different direction. That gives me joy. That should give us joy. That no matter what we do, no matter if we get fired, no matter if they break up with us, no matter if we go into debt and we make a dumb financial decision, no matter if we say the wrong thing to someone, no matter if we lose it on our kids, if we don't get the project in time, if we didn't meet our goals, he still loves us and we're secure in him. So that situation, that circumstance might not be bringing me joy, but I can find joy in the fact that I'm still connected and secure in my savior. Point number three is this, joy is our relationship with others. So often we try to make our joy come from the situations and circumstances we go through in life. Man, I'd be so hyped right now if I got that job. Man, if I'm just praying for a raise, if I could get a raise, that would mean more income and more income means more freedom. More freedom means more experiences. More, fr more experiences means doing more that I like and doing more that I like means more joy. Our joy is actually not found out there. Our joy is found in here and in those we choose to surround ourselves with. Our joy comes from our relationships with others. We see this in Paul. Paul, if you don't know who Paul was, the Apostle Paul, he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. This preacher, apostle, missionary, uh, businessman, entrepreneur, he did it all for the kingdom. He lived this crazy, wild adventure of a life for Jesus and suffered incredible hardships. He's quite literally like the poster child for Christianity. And this is what he says to the church in Thessalonica. A couple thousand years ago, he writes this to this church and he says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? So all the things in this life, all the things that Paul experienced, all the things that he went through, that he could have said, you know what gave me joy? building a lot of big churches. You know what gave me joy? Being able to sow financially into these, these missionaries. You know what made me so full of joy? When I was shipwrecked, I didn't die. When I was stuck in the middle of the ocean, I actually survived that. You know what gave me joy? Getting out of prison. And I'm sure those things gave him joy and he was super grateful. But when he has the opportunity to say, you know what gives me joy? You know what the crown of my life is? the glory of my life, the thing that I'm going to boast in when Jesus comes back and we spend eternity with him, I'm going to boast in you. I'm going to boast in my friends. I'm going to boast in my relationships. I'm going to boast in the people that I encounter and the people that I do life with. We so easily get caught up and distracted by like the big things, right? Those pinnacle moments. Man, if I could just get that, it would make me happy and I'd be so full of joy. If I could just experience that, I'd just be so full of joy. But Paul's like, hey, you know what's going to give you joy? Your relationships, the people you do life with. You know where joy is found? It's found in the mundane. We hate the mundane. And I think this is why we feel like we lack joy. Because being full of joy, complete like having your joy be complete and full is being able to find joy in every circumstance, being content in every moment, not needing the next thrill or the next adventure, although those things are great and we're allowed to have things we look forward to in life, but joy is found sitting at the dinner table with your family. 
You ever have those moments where you're with people you've known for a long time, maybe even your spouse or your kids, and you look at them and you have this realization, and this is going to sound like a very like stoner thing to say, but you're looking at them and you're just like, wow, like they're them. Like they're here in this room with me. And like they're not just a body, they're a soul and a personality and they've got experiences and pains and hurts. And I just like, I, I, I like them and I, I love them and I appreciate them and I'm grateful for them. What if we had more moments where we just realize the people who God has already given us are enough and that they're the ones who bring us more joy than the promotion or the new car or the bigger house. Just going on a date with your spouse or your significant other, and not talking about work or the things you always talk about, but just like asking them about their dreams and getting to know them on a deeper level. You can spend 80 years learning new things about someone. What would it look like to find joy in learning another new thing? What if we made it our mission? Every time I spend time with with my friends, every time I spend time with my wife or my husband, every time I spend time with my kids, I'm going to try to learn something new about them. How much more full of joy would our lives be instead of chasing after things that don't really matter at the end? I've been really convicted lately by this idea of legacy, leaving a lasting mark. I've concluded in my own soul that I don't care what you think of me when I die, but I care about what my kids think of me, and I care about what my wife thinks of me. Who cares if my name is on a sign or a building? I won't be around to experience it. But what I can experience right now is getting on the ground with my daughter and playing some game that I don't even know the rules for. (laughs) Or sitting next to my wife on the couch and just enjoying that she's there, that she chose me. She could have had any man on this planet even buff ones. <laughs> she chose me. It's in the mundane, friends. It's in moments like this, just sitting in church. We do 50 of these a year, but just coming and just appreciating. Man, I'm in the house of the Lord with people who are on mission and have the same vision. We can find joy in the little things. Paul found joy in the little things. You know what brings me joy? You know what my my crown at the end of my life is? It's you. I want to work less and love more. I'm done with the hustle life. I want to do things with excellence. I want to do things well. I want to impact people, absolutely. But I'm going to spend more time with the people that I love with my family and my friends, and build memories and have moments with them. And I know that's going to give me joy. The next thing is this, and I think it's directly connected. Joy is our perspective. you got to choose joy. It's not a feeling that's just going to happen to you. Now, God has made it available to you, but you've got to choose it. You've got to decide, I'm going to appreciate just looking in their eyes. I'm going to appreciate just hanging out with them. I'm going to turn my brain off to the things at work, and I'm just going to be in this moment. You have to decide what you're going to put your time and attention towards. There's this story in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. There's this whole thing where the wall of Jerusalem has been knocked down. Nehemiah, this leader, he rallies a group of people and he gets permission to rebuild the wall that exists around the city of Jerusalem. And he, he rallies these people and they work really hard and they rebuild this wall in like record time. It's crazy. It's a miracle. Super cool. And then as they finish building the wall, one of their prophets, whose name is Ezra, he stands up and he begins reading the law, the Old Testament law. And after he reads the law, the people who he read it to, the people who were there, the remnant, who were working on this wall and wanted to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, they wanted to follow God and and live according to his ways, they begin weeping and crying. They're upset. 
because they've realized that they don't measure up to this law. They realize that they fall short. And they're so discouraged that they had the audacity to sin against the God who just rescued them. And so they're basically throwing a pity party and they're like, they, 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 we're so sinful, we're so bad, we're so flawed, we're so messed up, How that God must hate us. And the leaders stand up and they say, do not grieve, do not mourn. This is a holy day. This is a good day. Rejoice in this day. And what do the people do? They receive that. And they begin to rejoice and they begin to celebrate and they begin to focus on the good things that God was doing in their lives and in the present and into their future rather than dwelling on the fact that they were flawed, broken, frail, messed up human beings. Where are you putting your focus? We can acknowledge that we are sinful and in need of a savior, but where our mindset should live is in the grace and the goodness of God. So often, we have people speaking this to us, right? We have friends in our corner encouraging us, sermons that are encouraging and uplifting, but when we find ourselves in these states, we refuse to receive it. You don't have to beat yourself up. No, I do. God loves you. No, he doesn't. You're, you're my friend. No, you're, you're faking it. We refuse to receive the encouragement of God from the word, from himself, and from others. We actually have to put in the work and choose to have the right perspective if we want to experience joy. They chose it. It was always available. The leaders are like, no, you can choose joy. You don't have to live in this state. You can have joy in your life. They're like, we want joy in our lives. What do we have to do? Look at joy. Think about joy. Think about the good things of God. Don't think about yourself. Don't esteem yourself so high that you think God can't love you because you're sinful. That's the whole point of the gospel message. You're not enough, but he is. So I'm not going to focus on my shortcomings and where I fall short. I'm going to focus on the fact that he is enough. He is the one who defeats the giant. He is the one who has power beyond power. He is the one who levels the valley. He is the one who raises up the mountains. I'm going to focus on him. It's our perspective. And finally, joy is our strength. So in this very text, Nehemiah chapter 8, in, in verse 10, as they're giving this pep talk to the people, hey, stop focusing on where you went wrong and start focusing on all the things that God is doing right. Rejoice in the fact that he is good and he is God and he is your God and you are his. We hear, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And team, you can come up. We're going to wrap up the service in just a few moments. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you feel weak this morning? Do you feel tired this morning? Do you feel burdened this morning? Do you feel like, man, I can't go on? I'm just tired. I'm trying so hard hard but it just seems like yeah there's these moments of like I love my life but then there's these moments of weakness it is not a strength issue it is a joy issue for when you feel weak it is because you are lacking joy the joy of the Lord is my strength. Where do you get strength from? You get it from joy. Where do you get joy from? You get it from Jesus. And here we go full circle. What is joy? It is being connected to God. It is not about getting stronger. It is not about getting more joy. 
This collection is not about being more kind, being more loving, experiencing more peace. The whole idea of the fruit of the Spirit is being connected to Jesus. Stop overcomplicating your Christianity. If you're going to chase after one thing, chase after Jesus. From being joyful, you get strength. From Jesus, you get joy. What do you get from Jesus? Everything. What do you need? You can get it from Jesus. What do you want? You can get it from Jesus. The idea is simple. Surrender your life, your ambitions, your goals, your dreams, your finances, your family, your friends, your relationships, your careers, Here, God, I don't want it. I just want you. And I want what you have for me. And what God has for you is so much better than you could ever conjure up on your own. His dreams, his goals, his desires are so much better than yours. We're trying so hard to be a vine. We're struggling and joy is fleeting and far away. Today, we get to reorient our lives and say, I'm a vine, I'm a a branch. I'm a branch. I just want Jesus. I just wanna serve him. I just wanna follow him. And as we do that, we get joy, we get strength, we get peace, we get love, we get kindness, we get self-control, we get faithfulness, We get goodness. It's not about being a better person, a better Christian. It's about chasing the one who is better than it all. His name is Jesus.